How do you respond to a friend when someone they love passes away? What do you do? What do you say? The greatest gift that you give is the gift of your presence. You may say something profound and deep. They probably won't remember that. But they will remember that you are there. They will remember your presence. For some people, grief is an emotion they fear. They may not even think it's Christ-like. I'm not sure why that is. Your grief is okay to have. It, it reminds yourself that you're human and that there's hurt and that we feel that, that, that deep inside. And Jesus' words today about resurrection life are great words to that. Jesus processes his own grief and, and comes through on the other side. And, and this day's message might just hit a spot where it's a little sensitive this morning. About four years ago, a friend of mine named Lenny Bush passed away. Uh, Lenny and I went to seminary together way back in 1981. And we both got to hear this great motivational talk, which I would not recommend. Look to your left, look to your right. Only one of three of you is going to come out of seminary at the end. I'm glad Lenny wasn't sitting next to me that day. Lenny's great-grandmother, I think, is Clara Bush, and she prayed for a church in this place. Uh, Lenny's father-in-law, Fred Holler, uh, was a member here for many years till he went up to heaven. And that's how Lenny and I reconnected. We were just acquaintances in school. I, I uh, always admired him as a student, but I just didn't know him that well. And then he and Frida would come out from Oklahoma to visit Paradise and get some good Mexican food and see Fred and family. And uh, we would always go out together. I discovered what a wise and gifted pastor he was. And when he passed away, I was deeply moved. I did the service alone up here. I remember at one point I looked over that way because usually Pastor Peterson's over on that side. And I said, I need a boo-hoo backup. I just couldn't hold it together that day. And Lenny's been gone four years. And there's two truths that I still hold in my heart. One, I still grieve his passing. I still miss talking to him. He was a wise person. He's a great pastor. And I look forward to a great reunion in heaven. That one, for me, kind of overweighs the grief in most situations. It kind of drives me. In your announcement page, you'll see at the very bottom, there's one for Naomi's place. And that meets the first Wednesday of every month. If, if you're dealing with some grief stuff, that might be a good next step for you to take. Now, the good news is grief does not get the final answer. Jesus does. And his answer is always good. Some wise person once told me, you don't get over the death of someone. You can learn to get through it. It's okay to grieve. It's okay to feel sorrow. But today I invite you to discover Jesus I am word, which is not just for the end of life, but really when you and I begin to understand it and embrace it is for all of life. So I invite you to use the gold insert in your order of service and take notes on this morning's message as we look at this I am statement of Jesus from John chapter 11, verses 25 and 26. Jesus said to her, that's Martha, I am the resurrection of life. He who believes in me will live even though he dies, and whoever lives and believes in me will never die. Before we look at what Jesus' resurrection power means for life today, let's go to him in prayer. Lord Jesus, thank you for not only being the resurrection of life, but offering such a gift to us today. Open our hearts to believe you are with us and to find in you the life that is truly life. Holy Spirit, speak through your word that we might discover Jesus as our life restorer. His name I pray. Amen. When Jesus said, I am the resurrection and life, he's talking about heaven, but he's not only talking about heaven. We hear these words, and, and there's some mistakes we make when we hear them. We'll look at that. But even more today, I invite you to embrace, three embraces of what Jesus gives in these words to you and to me, not, not just at the end of life, but starting in the waters of baptism, starting where you're living life right now. These three embraces speak of resurrection power, 
of what it means that Jesus is with us in the midst of life and how he transforms life so that we experience God working through us and in us and for us to reach this world that he loves. These three embraces are an invitation to discover what it means when Jesus says, I am the resurrection and the life. Here's the first embrace. Embrace his presence for your life today. Embrace his presence for, like, right now. You see, the first mistake we make is we think, well, well Jesus lived like 2,000 years ago. Or we go the other way. Well, uh, I'll see Jesus and be with Jesus when I get in heaven. Both of those are true, but Jesus is here now. He said, I am with you always. He promised to be with us. That's part of his promise in what happens in baptism. It's the great gift that he gives. In 1958, Bishop Lejos Ordis of the Lutheran Church of Hungary was imprisoned by the communists for about six years. They put him in solitary confinement. Not just solitary confinement, but there wasn't a door you could look through. There were no windows. He was surrounded completely by walls. They thought they would drive him crazy. He later said this, They thought I was alone. They were wrong. The risen Christ was present in that room. And in communion with him, I was able to prevail. When it came to Lazarus' illness and death, Jesus knows what's happening to Lazarus. And yet he waits. He waits, John tells us, until four days have passed. And, and four days is significant. The Jews in Jesus' day believed that after the body passed away for three days, the, the spirit would kind of hover around the body, I guess to see if he made a comeback of some type. So that in case there was a chance you might be reunited. But as uh, Martha says, uh, and I, I prefer the King James Version. The NIV says bad odor. The King James Version, she says to Jesus, Lord, he stinketh. <laughs> I just think that's funny. So I don't know if the spirit can't stand the smell anymore, and that's why it leaves. But around day four, they figured body and soul were separated, n never to be reunited again, that, that death was final. Also, in the Jewish system of grieving, which is a very good system for grieving, the first seven days are for intense grieving in the process. Family and friends gather together. They mourn. They, they, they wail. They, they support they're present. And so Jesus comes in, in, in day four. And though Mary and Martha talk to Jesus at different times, uh, look at the question they ask him. It's both the same question, whether you read verse 21 or verse 32. Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. Mary and Martha say the same thing. It sounds a little passive aggressive to me. Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. Ever done that one with God? Lord, I thought, I thought you were there for me. Where were you? What, what happened? Where are you? And that could be a test of our faith. Lord, if you had been there, then you fill in the blank. Yet what I admire about Martha is she doesn't stop there. She continues on. Verse 21 and 22, the question and then her response. Lord, Martha said to Jesus, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. Then look how she continues. But I know that even now, God will give you whatever you ask. If you had been here. But I know that even now, I love those two words, even now. Even now, God will give you whatever you ask. Day one has passed of her brother's passing. Day two, day three, day four. And she still has some kind of hope. She looks forward to resurrection and reunion. And Jesus speaks to her, not of the future, nor of the past, but the present, he doesn't say, I was the resurrection and the life. He doesn't say, I will be the resurrection and the life. He speaks in present tense. I am 
the resurrection and the life. He invites her and us to embrace his presence. Maybe God hasn't acted in the way you wanted him to act. But you and I are still invited to embrace his presence. You, you, you do that in prayer. God doesn't test you on eloquence. God wants your honesty. You pour out your heart to him. You share your hurts and your hopes. You share what leads you to despair. And you share what leads you to dream great dreams. You embrace his presence. You do that in his word. You, you do that. We have a page three and four to our Grow, Pray, Study guide. It just has the verses from the message. It has questions to talk over with God in prayer. Why? It's an invitation to, to embrace his presence. Here's the second embrace Jesus offers. You embrace his care for your life today. You embrace his care. Uh, most Christians don't question whether God has the power. They know God has the power. They've seen that power. They've read about that power. The question is, is that power available for me? God loves the world, but does God love me? Does God show his care when I'm hurting? How, how does God re respond to that? We look at the life of Jesus. Some of his closest friends are named Mary and Martha and Lazarus. He's very close to this family. And he's deeply moved by what happens to them. He's deeply moved by your troubles, too. You are part of his family. He longs to be in a relationship with you. His love is that great. His care is that great. He sees the problems you and I face. He understands. John describes how Jesus is moved in this story. He uses the shortest verse in the Bible to do that. In verse 35, he says, Jesus wept. Now just say that with me. Jesus wept. I'll try it again. Say this with me. Jesus, Jesus wept. wept. You can memorize a verse. You now know your first Bible verse right there. Jesus wept. Then in verse 38 it says, Jesus once more deeply moved, came to the tomb. It was a cave with a stone laid across the entrance. I've always asked this question. Why? Why does Jesus weep? He knows like within five minutes or ten minutes, I'm guessing 15 at the max, he's going to say, Lazarus, come out, and Lazarus is coming out. I, I would have think, would have thought he had a smile on his face. I would have thought maybe a little smirk or, or, or maybe just a little bit of a chuckle underneath his breath. He, he knows what's going to happen. But it doesn't say that. It says Jesus wept. And the, the word for wept there isn't like he just teared up. It's like the full blown on shake your whole body kind of weeping. It comes from your toes. It, it comes from your throat. It comes out of your eyes. Your whole body convulses. He's moved that deeply. Why? Now, the Bible doesn't tell us. I have a theory, just a theory. My, my, my opinion, I guess. I, I think he was so moved by the pain that death caused that wasn't part of God's original plan. God's plan is that he would create us and we would live with him forever. And all this other bad stuff that has happened, that includes death and illness, that's from sin. That's from Satan. That's a disruption of his original plan. You can put cancer, depression, heart attack, diabetes, leukemia, whatever you want to throw in there. That, that wasn't part of the plan. And he's moved by that. Somebody suggested to me last night, they thought it was all the unbelief that it was around. And that might be true too. But he is deeply moved. The Bible does not tell us to deny our emotions. The Bible does not tell us to deny our grief. The Bible tells us to process those emotions and to hold on to Jesus with great hope. 
That's why I love the Old Testament lesson that was read earlier about Jesus, 700 years probably before he walked this earth. Isaiah 25, 9. In that day they will say, surely this is our God. We trusted in him and he saved us. This is the Lord. We trusted in him. Let us rejoice and be glad in his salvation. The move to embrace, whether it's Jesus' presence or Jesus' care, is an act of faith. It's an act of trust. Now, between you and me, that's a whole lot easier when God is tracking with what I hope he will do. But sometimes God goes in this direction. I go, what are you up to? And can I still trust him? And can you still trust him? And even though I wander off God's path, he has not left me. He has not left you. You can embrace his presence. You can embrace his care, not just for your past, not just for your future, but whatever you're facing in life today. Here's a third embrace. You can embrace his power at work in your life today. We read these great miracles that, that happen in John 11, and we go, wow, God is powerful. That's awesome. The mistake we make is I don't think that power is around anymore today. Some people even will go so far as say, miracles stop when the Bible start, stop being written. I don't believe that's true. God still works miracles. We just give them different names sometimes. But God's power is still at work to transform. You witnessed a miracle this morning. The waters of baptism. Life with God. The, the, the great work that, that God invites us to do. When Jesus starts talking about what he's going to do, uh, Martha says, look, I, I believe he will rise again one day. Look what she, how she puts it in verse 24. I know he will rise again in the, the resurrection at the last day. Now, in verse 21, she said, if you had been here, in other words, I know you can work in the past. And then she starts talking about the future. I know he will rise again. But Jesus' response is going to be one, look, I, I'm working right now. We read his story in the past. We know there comes a time for heaven. And he's saying, look, my power is at work right now. It's not I was the resurrection life or I will be the resurrection of the life. I am the resurrection and the life. And that's a gift from him. And so Jesus gives his I am statement, verse 25 and 26. I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will live even though he dies. And whoever lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? Jesus says, I am the resurrection and the life. It, it's not just an event anymore. It's a person. It's not just a religion or a ritual. It's a relationship. Dead things don't stay dead when resurrection walks in the room. And Jesus looks at the tomb where Lazarus is and says, take the stone away. And think for a moment. It is the story of two tombs. Both have a stone that's blocking the way. Jesus has the one rolled away so Lazarus can get out. And then the women go to the tomb on Easter Sunday. They, they wonder who will roll the stone away. And because it is rolled away, they know resurrection has happened. There may be part of you this morning that feels dead inside. You had your hope and heart set on this outcome. And that path has changed. It may have come to a horrible ending. And I want you to know that Jesus has rolled the stone away. That he is resurrection and life. And that he's calling out, come out so that new life can come in you. That is the beauty of this meal. The risen Lord meets us in this meal. And brings the gifts he brings of forgiveness and life and salvation. Your sins are forgiven not because you're good. But because he's good. And he can set you free because he's resurrection and life. We hear the story of John 11, or I hear the story of John 11 through Easter. Martha hears it through the grief of a heart that's mourning her brother's passing. And Jesus is bold to make his claim, but he does ask that question. Do you believe this? 
do you believe this? And in what may be one of the shortest professions of faith, she says, yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Jesus Christ didn't just come to the cross to make bad people good. Jesus came to make dead people alive. And resurrection, it just redefines reality in life. It redefines our relationship with God. And if we are wise, it redefines our relationship with each other. Where we have died, he brings life. My daughter, Laura, had a literature class in high school. They were studying how stories are told, especially in the movies. And one lesson I learned from her is if you see a red door in a movie, you know something bad's about to happen. I never knew that, by the way, until she told me that. That's called foreshadowing. I drive home, and at one point I turn on Lemon Avenue, and there's a house that has a red door. I always pray that bad things aren't happening in there. <laughs> And if you have a red door on your house, I just apologize. I don't mean to offend anybody. I'm just saying that's how the story goes. You're going to go home and watch a movie today, and you're going to see a red door. It's going to freak you out, but I apologize. That's when bad things happen. When you read the Bible, it seems that if there's rolled back stones, that, that means something good's going to happen. Lazarus is going to come out, or, or Jesus is going to come out. And Jesus rolls the stone away and yells, Lazarus, come out. And then I think two miracles happen. One is Lazarus comes back to dead. The other is that he comes out. Because in that day, they would wrap cloth around you. Like a hundred pounds of cloth and spices on the body. Because, you know, Lord, it stinketh. He would have been sol solidly wrapped. Think, think of the image, the visual image of a mummy. Except he can't just walk out. Because his legs are wrapped together. And I've been in the tomb in Israel. That, that, that would be a bit of a challenge. Uh, so I, here's what I think he did. I watch Hillsong. They hop really high when they sing praises. <laughs> it must have come from Lazarus. I think people were laughing when he came out. You got this guy jumping out like this. I think at his birthday the next year, they had a party. They said, hey, let's do the Lazarus hop. <laughs> How awesome is that? Now, I don't know about you, but I, I kind of wonder what happened to Lazarus. When I was a kid, I thought he was still alive today. We just had to go find him somewhere. I don't think that's true anymore. Church tradition has two different theories. Uh, neither one of them might have actually happened. One of them may have. But one is that he went to Cyprus, he became a bishop at a city there, and that the church of St. Lazarus is built in the modern city of Larnaca on the island of Cyprus over his second tomb. How often do you get to put that one on your resume? I have a second tomb. But he has life. Second church tradition has him and his sisters ending up in Marseille, France. And this one he's hiding in a tomb because the emperor Domitian is killing Christians, persecuting them, but killing them. And that tradition says that he got beheaded in that tomb and passed away there. Now Lazarus rises from the dead in John chapter 11, but it's not his final resurrection. He later died, his sisters died, they're all in heaven right now. He didn't have to wait till the end of time to get there or to experience God's power in his life. And there will come a day when, when you and I will pass, and by faith in Jesus, our life is in heaven. And the great reunion with my friend Lenny and a whole lot of other people I love will happen. But you don't have to wait until heaven to experience the work of God in your life either. You can experience the power of God in your life today. Embrace his presence. Embrace his care. Embrace his power. For he is the resurrection and the life. Let's go to him in prayer. Dear Jesus, you are the resurrection and the life. You are the grave robber and life restorer. Open our hearts to embrace the gifts of your presence, your care, and your power. We bring you our sin and the grit and grime of everyday life that we might embrace your grace 
and trust you are who you say you are. Holy Spirit, each day lead us to experience God's power at work in us and through us. We praise you, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, our holy and awesome God. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen.